passed away, and they keep doing that year after year, and just putting them, the bones, in one huge place where all the ancestors were there. And these archaeologists, modern-day archaeologists, found those depositories. They have found literally scores of years of family life that is registered by all the bones. And then they decided to take one entire depository and, and bring it here to America and presented the teeth they found to a dental school because you will actually find how old a person is by examining the teeth and, and ask what they could tell about the inhabitants of biblical time Israel. Now, amazingly, there was one cave that they found in 1970 or in the 70s this cave contained among the bones, they found 762 human teeth. All right, 762 human teeth. So an American dental school examined these teeth and they found amazing truth and facts. And this is what they found. Those teeth represent or represented 51 different individuals. So the 762 human teeth, it represents 51 different individuals. 13 out of the 51 individuals never lived to age 10. Only 4 out of the 51 lived to the age of 60. So that's why during that time, if you live to 60 and past 60, you are really, really old and you are really, really tough. Because you're able to survive all this hard work in, 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 in their lives. Only four out of 51 lived to the age of 60. And all 51 individuals, their teeth actually showed almost complete diets of rough grain. What is this telling us? They had actually worn their teeth down. They were not eating soft and fancy food during the time that the Lord called Israel to Canaan, to the promised land. So why am I sharing this during this time of stewardship? Well, because that's the world of the Israelites, of the Hebrew people, when God called them. And we can say maybe during the time there are rich people, but we're talking here about the normal and, and not really, really poor but the average Hebrew family, and that's how they live. That's how they survive. And God put on them a strict code of his law for these hardworking farmers and herdsmen and that made up of his people. And what did the Lord Almighty demanded from them? First of all, God said, you work hard. First of all, you have to give your tithes. Malachi 3 10. All right? Also in Leviticus 27, 30, it's not in our passage, but in Leviticus, God also told them to bring your, your the first, uh, first uh, fruits, your, your first, uh, like your choicest animal. You set it aside. It belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. But in Malachi 3, 10, this is what the word of God says. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. See, that's what God told them. Bring it to the storehouse so that the Levites will have the support so that there will be food in, my, food in my house. And try me in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be enough room to receive it. So, God asked them to give the tent of everything that they harvest, their, their herds. They had to set aside the best and bring it to the Lord as their tithe. And so, can you imagine these people working so hard every day, and then they have to set aside 10%, and they were not really earning that much. But then on top of that, God said, you have to give me a free will offering. Exodus 25, 1 and 2, on top of your tithes, Exodus 25, 1 and 2 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly. With his heart you shall take my offering. 
So here we see that after they give their tithes, they were asked by the Lord to give freely. So their offering to the temple is not being, they're not being forced to, to do it. They're not being required by God to do it. The tithe is more on, hey, you have to do this because if not, you will suffer. But then God was saying, if you give your free will offering, that will be coming from your heart. And this willingness of heart is emphasized in the Bible over and over again. And the beauty of it is that giving in this way provides more than enough. Because free will giving, <coughs> excuse me, free will giving was always what came out of a willing heart. It's always coming out of a willing heart. Proverbs 3 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all that increase. It's to honor the Lord. It's not tithe here, but it's the first fruits of all that increase. And in 1 Chronicles 29 9, this is even more uh, powerful. It says, Then the people rejoiced. Why did they rejoice? For they had offered willingly. All right, they have offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. So, with all of that, the question for us today is would God expect less of me? Is it fair to ask, Lord, do you really expect less of me? A blessed person living in this rich and prosperous country almost in the whole universe? Do you expect less than you demanded the, the poor Israelite, the, the poor po uh, farmer who works 14 hour days, 6 days a week just to survive? So, if we think about God's demands on the people of Israel during that time, what does God's grace impels us to do? So it's the tithe in the Old Testament is you have to bring the tithe and you have to give willingly. And how about now? We have been given so freely by the grace of God. Now let me share with you some quotes from our forefathers in the faith. First is uh, the person by the name of John Wesley. John Wesley who wrote many hymns that we love in our hymn books today, he said, and I quote, Money never stays with me. It would burn me if I did. I throw it out of my hands as soon as possible, lest it should find its way into my heart. And he went on to say, Remember, the Lord said, Be careful because you can love and worship money. End quote. That's his heart. He decided to do that. And then there's another person. Hudson Taylor said, The less I spend on myself and the more I gave to others, the fuller of happiness and blessing did my soul become. These are people who are great in faith and the Lord has used them so mightily and yet they surrendered everything to the Lord. And the Lord kept blessing them. And we can quote more and more and more people who have tried the Lord and tested the Lord and the Lord has blessed them so much. But let's look around. America is one of the wealthiest. Now it's not the wealthiest. <laughs> America right now is one of the wealthiest and yet the most unhappy society in the world. And so as the rest of the industrialized nation. So the lesson for us, beloved, is that God has given some very, very timely warnings to us at the beginning of the 21st century in the most wealthy and consumptive society that have ever existed on planet Earth. And this is what God says. God says, I want you to know how you should live. I want you to know how you should live. And with that, I would like to invite you to please stand with me. Please stand with me. I don't want you to fall asleep. And follow along as I read 
Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 to 15 from the New King James Version, and it should be in our screen. Ecclesiastes 5, 10 to 15, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners except to see them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches kept for, their own, for the owner to his hurt. But those riches perish through misfortune. When he begets a son, there is nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, Naked shall he return, to go as he came, and he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us this book, this wisdom literature, the book of Ecclesiastes. And thank you for giving us your instruction through this book, your wisdom, your plan for our lives, the big picture, how to live in a way that reflects our wisdom, your presence and our surrender to you. Lord God, I pray that as we look at the stewardship of our giving, that we will see that under your grace, you allow us to reflect our love for you by giving back to you first ourselves, then our treasures, and invest in you, in your church, in your kingdom, and as the fragrance of Christ to the poor of this world. Father in heaven, teach us how to even more fully discipline ourselves to the stewardship of our giving. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. As I, as I pondered this passage in Ecclesiastes, I was deeply, deeply struck by, by the truth of what it means. So as we go along in this passage, I will, I will be sharing with you some, um, we call it maybe other translation, but it's not other translation, but like, it's like, this is how it really means, and it's, this is how it, it's really being said. And the truth, the, what it means, and what is going on in the lives of people. So as we go along, I want you to capture this with me, and I, I hope that it will capture you over and over again. And so let's, let's go through it again, through the verses. And I have eight uh, very important items that I'd like to share with you. First of all, in verse 10, it says, Whoever loves money or silver never has money enough or never has silver enough. And, and, and this is the point of this verse. The more you have, the more you want. Right? Right? We agree on that? The more you have, the more you want more. And there's no need of explanation of that phrase. That is very true. Second, it says, whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. All right, so if you compare the first one to the second one, the first one is just like loving silver and will not be satisfied with silver, or those who love money will never be satisfied with money. But in, in number two, it says, whoever Love's wealth is never satisfied with his income. Now, this is talking about work, right? Income. And it says, and in other words, it says, the more you have, the less you're satisfied. Isn't that true? Here in this country and in other developed countries about finding a job. So many people here in America, they always are temporarily where they are at work because they're trying to find a better, higher paying, more benefits kind of job. And so they were always saying, oh, I'm not really 
taking root in this job because I'm looking for another opportunity that I can earn more. And you, you, you will hear this from, from young professionals, and, and especially when you go to the city in Manhattan. The lesson to that is the more you have, the less you are satisfied. Think about it. Here in America, the, the, the satisfaction level is way up there. And the contentment level is here because we always want to equal our goal to be satisfied. And when you do that, there is no point that you will be satisfied. And it will rob you of your joy and the satisfaction that God wants you to have. Number three. In the book of Ecclesiastes, as goods increase, so those who consume them. <laughs> 